think that may be the last step. Yeah, that was it. That was the last one. You can put the picture on that one too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to jump around and talk about all the topics together, but it should be clear while there's a history of protests in America. I'm sure just from seeing and hearing what we just saw and heard, right? Is yeah. everybody clear on why there's an yes. issue with the history of protest? Um, and I have a list, and anybody who wants to see it later on can come up and see it, but there's a full list of uprisings that took place in America starting in 1900, going all the way up to 1992, which was when that one took place, after Rodney King was, was brutally beat. And it's pretty clear why. It's a lack of education. It's just a simple. We don't know enough about each other. So we see each other and we think we're enemies of each other, mainly black people. We become enemies because of the fact that we were property. We were slaves. So we were valuable then. Well, after, ironically, the first lynching started taking place in 1865, right after we were set free. You wouldn't kill your property, right? Of course, if you were something, you wouldn't kill us. So it's not ironic that also the Ku Klux Klan started in 1866. We were set free in 1865. You didn't need a clan because the slave owner was allowed to do whatever he wanted to do to his property. So the history of a protest in America is clear. When you let people free who you didn't ever want to be set free in the first place. So, and um, just to back that up, this book is titled 100 Years of Lynching. 100 years. I didn't write it, so it's clear. And again, we don't. We don't educate ourselves enough on what's going on, so we still have these problems. We shouldn't even really be talking about this right now. This man should have a job. It's obvious that he should have a job. And it's obvious why he doesn't have a job. Because he took a stand. And none of us don't even know the flag codes. If we understood the flag codes, which is not really important in this whole scheme of things, the flag itself, the code says the flag shouldn't be laying flat. If you read the flag codes, it says the flag should never be laying flat. It's a disrespect to the flag. Here, let me read it for you right well, now. Well, when they come out on the field, the flag is laying flat. Let me, let me, let me help you a little bit, because that was actually. Oh, that was part of your. That's OK, okay. but let me help you. Sorry. You can keep going. OK. All right. Section 8, entitled Respect for the Flag, states the flag should never be used as wearing apparel, bedding, or dra drapery. No part of the flag should ever be used as a costume or athletic <coughs> uniform. Section 3 of the flag code defines the flag as anything by which a person seen the same without deliberation may believe the same to represent the flag of the United States of America. Also in Section 8, the flag should never be carried flat or horizontally, but always aloft and free. Specifically, <clears throat> what are you talking about? Sorry. Good time. Code prohibits using the flag for any advertising purposes. It also states that the flag should not be embroidered, printed, or otherwise impressed on articles such as cushions, hand handkerchiefs, napkins, boxes, or anything intended to be discarded after temporary use. Both of these codes are generally ignored and almost always without comment. So who's disrespecting the flag? Every time you watch a game and you see the military holding it horizontally, they're disrespecting the flag. So he's doing no more than what is already being done. And he doesn't have a job. So we're being hypocritical in a situation where he's getting a bad rap for something that every single game they do every time before the game starts. They're disrespecting the codes that they themselves wrote, that this country itself wrote. So it's being disrespected on a regular basis. So it's not really about Kaepernick or, or, or the national anthem, because if you listen to the end of the national anthem, land of the free, home of the brave. Um, who knows when the national anthem was written? 1814. We were still slaves in 1814. So it doesn't fit me anyway. I'm not supposed to stay in because it wasn't written for me. Land of the free, home of the brave. I've never been free. 
And it wasn't very brave to come and steal people from home and bring them somewhere and make them work for free. So it, it's not really an issue about that. It's about respect for other people's culture. And I think that's what Americans always had a problem with, respect for culture. I'll bleed right into the Harlem Renaissance. Um, this book is titled The Black Poets, and it covers a great deal of the Harlem Renaissance, which spans from like around 1919 through about 1930s, the early part of the 1930s, right after the, the, the last war. Um, Carl McKay, I'm not going to read a poem out of here, but Carl McKay wrote the poem, If We Must Die, because of all the lynchings that were taking place in America at that time, the Harlem Renaissance writers were writing about the lynchings that were taking place. So the poem is, If We Must Die, and at the end of the poem he says, If We Must Die, it'll be with our backs to the wall, fighting back. This poem was written in 1919. Well, shortly after is what started taking place. In Chicago, the major riot took place in Chicago in 1919 a whole lot of oppressors lost their lives because the, the citizens were tired of being killed. So they said, okay, we're gonna die. Some other people are gonna die with us. You can look up that riot, the riot of Chicago, 1919. It was just about evenly matched. Before the end, it was hundreds of blacks were being killed and maybe two or three people who were causing the problems were being killed. But Chicago was pretty much matched, tit for tat. Because at that time, we were fighting back. We had, had decided it was had enough. And he decided it was best to write about this because the poets have always been the voice of the oppressed. We have to voice out what the masses are thinking, which is what made the Harlem Renaissance as important as what it was. From Langston Hughes to Conti Colin to um, uh, the, the great, great strong black females who, who were around at the time, Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote many, many stories about oppression and many stories about lynching. So the Harlem Renaissance played a very pivotal role and lynchings and what was taking place at the same time. It was using their voice and their pen to help do away with some of those problems that we were facing at the time. So um, I know I can feel myself going on a tangent, so I'm gonna kind of <laughs> wean into how all of that ties into, even at the time when the Harlem Renaissance was writing, there was something that was going on with, with boxing at the time. I think one of them wrote about Joe, about Joe, Joe Johnson, the black boxer. Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson. And that tied into what he was going through as a black man, as a boxer, who was beating up white opponents and how he was being treated for, even though he was the champion of the world at the time, how he was being treated for what was taking place in the ring, that he was taking out his oppressive nature on his oppressors in the ring. Well, I thought that's what he was supposed to do. I thought that was his job as a fighter to do that. So, so I want to just tie back into sports so I can let some of my, uh, you know, Extremely intelligent uh, people to my right. Uh, go ahead and get in and speak. And then to come back, we're just going to go back and forth. So I just want to go ahead and open the floor. Whoever else wants to take it. It's a good time. Move the picture. Okay, I did see something interesting today. I'm going to interrupt it and ask you to please oh. use the microphones because not everybody. Oh, did everybody hear me? I'm sorry. Was everybody hear me? Okay. Can everyone hear me? No, not yet. No. 